This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Captivology, The Science of Capturing People's Attention by Ben Parr. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 3, The Framing Trigger. In the early 1900s, antiperspirants and deodorants were not the $18 billion commodity that they are today. Mum, a deodorant, and Everdry, an antiperspirant, were both on the market, but they weren't in every bathroom. Women of the era used a combination of perfume, dress shields, and cotton pads to keep perspiration at bay, while sweat was a sign of manliness and strength for men in the early 1900s when labor and farming jobs still dominated. Many people of the era thought that blocking sweat was unhealthy. More importantly, though, it was considered uncouth to talk about your bodily functions, so the market remained nascent. This didn't deter Edna Murphy, a teenage entrepreneur from Cincinnati. She knew that her surgeon father had invented a million-dollar product, liquid antiperspirant. Originally created to keep her father's hands dry during surgeries, Edna soon realized that it kept her armpits fresh and free of sticky sweat. Determined, Edna Murphy borrowed $150 from her grandfather, and in, eight, and in 1910, she built a sales force of women and launched her antiperspirant, Odorono. It didn't take off like she imagined it would, though. The old habits and beliefs about hygiene and antiperspirants were simply too much for her to overcome. Antiperspirants had a reputation problem. After her confidence was boosted by some mild success at a 1912 summer exposition in Atlantic City, Edna turned to James Webb Young, a copywriter at J. Walter Thompson Company, for help breaking her product out. Young, a former Bible salesman, knew that it wasn't Odorono itself that was holding sales back. It was the market's perception of all antiperspirants. He knew that they had to use some clever advertising to change that. Young and Murphy t first tackled the claim that stopping perspiration with an antiperspirant was unhealthy. This one wasn't difficult. With an advertising campaign that highlighted the fact that Odorono was developed by a doctor, they were able to double sales. The real magic, however, occurred in 1919, when Young decided to stop focusing on Odorono's virtues and reframe society's attitudes toward antiperspirant. Young's taboo campaign, titled Within the Curve of a Woman's Arm, a frank discussion of a subject too often avoided, ran in Ladies' Home Journal. The controversial ad cuts right to the point, quote, Many a woman who says, No, I am never annoyed by perspiration, does not know the facts. She does not realize how much sweet and daintier she would be if she were entirely free from it, end quote. Pause, Grant's comments. This is strange and more reinforcing of gender stereotypes. My own comment, continuing to read. According to Smithsonian Magazine, 200 women canceled their subscriptions to Ladies Home Journal because of the offensiveness of the ad. Several of Young's female friends stopped talking to him as well. The controversy was well worth the price. Sales of Odorono skyrocketed by 112% to $417,000 in just one year. By 1927, that number broke one million. In 1929, after two decades of blood, sweat, and more sweat, Edna Murphy sold the company she'd started with a $150 loan. James Young would eventually become vice president of JWT, the first chairman of the Advertising Council, a professor with the University of Chicago, and one of the greatest minds in the history of advertising. Why did Odorono take off when so many other attempts to popularize deodorant and antiperspirant failed? And what attention-grabbing techniques can we learn from Murphy and Young's savvy campaigns? The Framing Trigger While attention is often triggered by an event, a smell, or some other stimulus, most of our attention is goal-driven. We make a conscious decision to focus on an assignment because our goal is to complete it and receive a good grade. And we check our text messages because our goal is to find out what our friends are saying. Where we direct our attention is a choice. And the decision of how we allocate it determines which people we choose to date, which movies and shows we watch, and which ideas live or die. Frames of reference help us make these choices. They help us draw on our experiences and previously acquired knowledge to make sense of the world. 
we process information in a way that uses our existing frames of reference, said Dr. Dietram Schufel, a communications scholar at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, saying, quote, we don't start from scratch every single time, end quote. To explain what Schufel means here, indulge me for a moment in a little thought exercise. For this exercise, take out a piece of paper and draw a tree. What did you draw? I bet that you drew something with branches, leaves, a tree trunk, and bark. If I had included crayons with this book, I suspect that the leaves would be green and the trunk would be brown. You were able to do this because you already know the basics of a tree. When you encounter an object with a thick brown trunk and thousands of green photosynthetic organs, you can immediately categorize it as a tree, or more specifically as a palm tree or a pine tree, because you already have knowledge of trees and what they're supposed to look like. Everybody has a general idea of what a tree is supposed to look like, just as everybody knows what vanilla should taste like or what a purring cat should sound like. These mental structures, or schemata, help us understand the world and identify the objects around us. Years of experience have helped us build mental frameworks, preconceptions, and opinions about how the world should work. Address books should be organized in alphabetical order, and climate change is either a proven fact or a work of fiction. These are our frames of reference. Our past experiences, biological wiring, cultural expectations, interests, opinions, and current moods influence our frames of reference. They are the context in which we make our choices or react the way we do, because no choice or reaction is ever made in a vacuum. If you develop a fear of dogs because you were bitten as a child, you will choose to be far more aware of dogs in your, in your vicinity because you perceive them as a threat. If you're exhausted, hungry, or emotionally distressed, you're not going to care about your professor's lecture on the ancient Peloponnesian War or my panel at the South by Southwest Conference, which is why I prefer to deliver presentations at the beginning of the day or right after lunch. To help us direct our attention, we rely both on our frame of reference when we encounter a, an idea or message and on how a message or idea is framed, the framing effect. The framing effect is a cognitive bias that affects the way we perceive a piece of information based on the way it is presented to us. We often make different conclusions about the same information when the explanation is changed even slightly. One of the most famous examples of the framing effect comes from Dr. Elizabeth Loftus and Dr. John Palmer, researchers at the University of Washington, who, in 1974, asked 45 students in five groups of nine to watch a series of clips depicting car accidents. After the videos, they were asked a simple question, quote, about how fast were the cars going when they collided with one another, end quote. Well, not quite that question. Each group received a slightly different question. While one group was asked how fast the cars were going when they collided, another group was asked how fast the cars were going when they bumped each other, and so on. The verb changed from group to group, and it was shown that a simple verb can drastically change the student's answer. Groups who were asked how, fa how fast the cars going when they smashed into each other estimated that they were going a little over 40 miles an hour while groups who, asked, who were asked how fast the cars were going when they contacted each other estimated the speed of about 30 miles an hour, a giant 22% difference, despite the students watching the exact same car crash. Frames of reference are not set in stone, though. Like Edna Murphy and James Young, you can change and influence the frames of reference of others. At first, Murphy and Young wouldn't sell their product because nobody was willing to talk about perspiration. So Murphy and Young reframed the national conversation around antiperspirant. Instead of trying to force a product a few women wanted, they attacked the taboo association of not just odorono, but all antiperspirants. The result was a dramatic shift in social bias. Just a few years after the 1919 campaign, antiperspirant had become a necessity for women. Those who wanted to be dainty and alluring wore antiperspirant. Other antiperspirant and deodorant companies started running their own ads, linking sweaty armpits to loneliness and man repellent. This only increased the size of the pie, making Odorono that much more successful. 
the framing trigger is all about changing how you present an idea to someone to make him or her more receptive to your message. Oh, very important. Politicians use framing all the time to affect the attention and reactions of their constituents. For example, a politician will get completely different reactions depending on if he frames a law restricting ownership on certain kinds of guns as gun control or as gun safety. The former sounds like government intervention. The latter just seems obvious. Of course, the political leanings, or frames of reference, of the politician's audience matter just as much. It doesn't matter whether the politician frames a law restricting guns as gun control or gun safety to an audience full of members of the NRA. That politician will have captured the audience's attention all right, in the sense that he will quickly become the least populous person there, or popular person there. Tell a hardcore gun control advocate about how the Second Amendment allows you to carry an assault rifle and you will get a similar reaction. And of course, there are people who simply don't care about the politics of guns and will tune out, no matter how the politician frames the law. Each of these groups has a different frame of reference. The framing trigger, however, is not as easy to leverage as it may seem, especially since people tend to hold on to their old frames of reference fiercely, a phenomenon which I call the inertia of ideas. To change someone's frame of reference and make them more receptive or attentive to your message, you have to understand why our frames of reference are so hard to change in the first place. The Inertia of Ideas Over the course of a year, Dr. Marianne Bertrand and Dr. Senhil Mulatanthan of the University of Chicago and MIT respectively sent 5,000 resumes in response to ads seeking people to fill clerical, customer service, and sales jobs. One set of resumes had higher quality credentials, while the other set had less impressive ones. The only thing Bertrand and Melanathan changed on each resume was the name on the top. While some resumes had traditionally Caucasian names like Emily or Brendan, others had tra traditionally African-American names like Aisha, Latoya, or Tyrone. The result was a shocking gap in callbacks. Despite having nearly identical resumes, the ones with African-American names received 50% fewer callbacks than the resumes with Caucasian names. The change in qualifications showed a similar bias. The resumes with Caucasian names received 30% more callbacks, while those with African-American names received only 9% more, despite having the same improvement in resume quality. Despite the progress we have made over the past century, prejudice still exists and doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. This is because stereotyping leads people to make snap judgments about individuals from certain groups, even when they know little to nothing about the individuals in question. We can come to different conclusions about a person based on something as simple as his or her name. These stereotypes stick around because it's incredibly difficult for us to change how we view the world, or our frame of reference. Even when we know our frame of reference is flawed, it's surprisingly challenging to give up. Our attention, over the long term, tends to focus on the same few ideas, people, and patterns. This leads to what I call the inertia of, our, of ideas. Once our frame of reference is set, it is incredibly difficult to change. Like concrete, our opinions on political issues or our beliefs about the world solidify over time and become harder and harder to break. Inertia, the physical resistance that objects have to changes in their state of motion, applies to our ideas as well. The inertia of ideas occurs because we don't have the mental energy to constantly change our frames of reference, and thus, where we place our attention. It, in a strange way, it makes sense. If you've already looked at the evidence and believe that the Earth is round, then why would you waste your precious time and energy every time a crazy person declares our planet is flat, is a pentagon, or secretly filled with lizard people? In this case, the inertia of ideas, of ideas is good, but it has also caused our society to hold on to terrible beliefs and systems like slavery, racism, and sexism for far longer than we should. Incorrect or outdated beliefs don't go away just because you place evidence in front of a person. The inertia of ideas is why charities struggle all the time to make their various causes a priority among the public. 
charities must convince thousands of people to adopt a social cause they aren't familiar with and donate money to that cause, when it is easier to donate to a charity they are already familiar with, or not donate at all. Even the most influential figures have a difficult time changing the agenda. Even when there's a spike of interest in a charity cause or a political agenda, it quickly dissipates and society returns to the status quo. Edna Murphy and James Young had to decisively break social taboos to make deodorant acceptable. It took a book and a multi-million dollar foundation for Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg to make a discussion about women at work and in leadership positions a priority among the public, and we are still far from workplace equality. If you're trying to capture attention with the framing trigger, then you have to be prepared to face the inertia of ideas, because it prevents your audience from being exposed to new ideas, products, and people that can improve their lives. People will unintentionally dismiss your ideas or your work because they don't fit their frames of reference or preconceptions. Pandora, the billion-dollar online radio giant, was famously rejected by not one or two, but 300 investors. Some didn't believe Pandora could make money, others didn't believe it had enough traction, and yet others were bearish on the music industry as a whole, which was consistently shrinking as the era of the CD came to a close. While a frame of reference built on experience helps investors avoid past mistakes, it can also blind investors to new opportunities that seem absurd on the surface. For example, IBM's Thomas Watson famously said in 1943 that, quote, there is a world market for maybe five computers, end quote. The inertia of ideas is not all powerful, though. You can capture attention despite people's frame of reference. Through the course of my research, I discovered two tools for tackling an audience's frame of reference and getting them to pay attention using the framing trigger. These are adaptation and agenda setting. Adaptation is about identifying your audience's frame of reference and adjusting to it. Agenda setting is a phenomenon that makes a specific topic more salient and important in the minds of your audience and thus changes their frames of reference to pay more attention to that topic whenever it comes up. First, let's talk about adaptation. To do that, I need to tell you the story of two violinists and how one was able to capture more attention than the other. A Tale of Two Violinists For 43 minutes on a cold January morning, master violinist Joshua Bell played six timeless masterpieces on his one-of-a-kind Stradivarius violin for a thousand people in Washington, D.C. Just three days earlier, the 39-year-old played history's greatest masterpieces in front of a crowd of 2,500 in Boston. As one would expect, Bell sold out the Boston Symphony Hall with relative ease, where good seats went for $100 a pop. His performances moved the audience to tears, something he had been able to do since he was four. He's even the proud recipient of a Grammy Award. His performance in Washington, D.C., on the other hand, was a completely different story. There was no price of admission for this concert. But despite the incredible deal, nobody stayed to listen. Nobody cried tears of joy or applauded enthusiastically. Nobody paid attention to one of the world's greatest musicians. What was the difference between his Boston concert and his D.C. performance? Well, for one thing, Bell was not playing in a crowded symphony hall. Instead, he was playing Bach's Cachon in the open at L'Enfant Plaza, one of the central transportation hubs in Washington, D.C. 10,070 people walked by him during the morning rush hour. Instead of wearing a tux and a bow tie, Bell wore a baseball cap and jeans. Instead of announcing his present, presence, he went incognito. Out of the 1,070 people who saw him, a grand total of 27 gave him money. Even more shocking, just seven people stopped to listen for more than 60 seconds. Only one person, Stacy Furukawa, recognized him. Unsurprisingly, she was shocked and dumbfounded to find him in the subway. One of the world's most brilliant musicians could only get 0.7% of the people who passed him to stop and listen. You've probably heard this story before. It's a famous experiment conducted by the Washington Post to see how many people would recognize the work of one of the world's greatest musicians outside of a concert hall. The answer? Not very many. 
But the experiment does not necessarily prove that violinists are unpopular attractions in subway stations. In fact, they can attract lots of people to listen to them play. I met Susan Kayser on a sweltering and muggy summer day in New York City, trudging through Grand Central Terminal, focused on finding the train back to my friend's place on the Lower East Side. But as I made my way through one of the station's long hallways, I couldn't help but hear the sound of violin music. As I walked, it got louder, until I eventually found a middle-aged woman, centrally located in the long hallway, playing her violin for a small crowd that had gathered. Susan wore a black and blue striped tank top, uncomfortable black pants, and gray tennis shoes. She wore her half-blonde, half-gray hair like a bun. Like me, her face was drenched in sweat. But there she was, playing Vivaldi's concerto in B minor, promoting her craft. I knew this because she had a giant sign announcing which song she was playing next to her. Susan is a 55-year-old professionally trained violinist who has played for world-class orchestras in Germany, Italy, and Turkey. She has spent years going back and forth between Europe and the United States, but she never found a permanent home in an orchestra. She said, orchestras want younger performers, once in an interview. When she moved to New York City in 2006, though, she decided to try a different path. While Joshua Bell may famously have played once in a subway station, Susan does it four, two to four times a week, throughout the year, through heat waves and blizzards. I feel like an ambassador for classical music, Susan tells me, trying to promote it to the masses. Susan is a common sight around New York's subways and next to the Christopher Columbus statue in Central Park on the weekends. I later learned that it wasn't uncommon for 40 to 80 people to be sitting on the benches of Central Park, listening to Kayser play a variety of classical masterpieces mixed with pop songs like Coldplay's Viva La Vida and Jason Mraz's I'm Yours. She's even been featured on the Today Show. She makes a decent living off her street and subway performances more than many professional musicians through a combination of CD sales and private gigs that are booked as a direct result of her public demonstrations. So why did Joshua Bell, an internationally recognized violin master, only get seven people out of a thousand to listen to his music for over a minute, while Susan Kayser attracts crowds ten times that size on a regular basis? The answer lies in Susan's ability to adapt to her audience's frame of reference. In a blog post analyzing Bell's subway performance, Susan's son offers the most plausible explanation for Bell's failure to attract crowds. He points out some important flaws in the Joshua Bell Washington Post experiment, starting with the most obvious one. Joshua Bell was playing during rush hour. I want you to place yourself in the frame of reference of a subway commuter in each situation. As you read each scenario, think about how you'd feel in the moment and what you'd do if you were in their situation. Take the instance, an example, of fictional character Lois Lane. It's rush hour in D.C., and Lois needs to get to work. There's an important Senate hearing she needs to cover for the Daily Planet. She's walking through the doors of the subway station and most likely fiddling around for her transit card so she can get to the train on time. By the time she's swiping her card, she hears the sounds of Bell's violin, but already past the gates. Alternatively, hear this example of other fictional character, Clark Kent. It's after rush hour, and Clark is heading to the other side of the city to meet up with a friend for a casual lunch in New York City. As he's walking through one of the subway's long corridors, he starts hearing the sound of echoing music, and it's getting louder. As it grows, he starts looking for the source of the sound, eventually spotting a woman violinist with long locks of gray hair. His curiosity grows as he gets closer. He can now see a music stand next to her with a piece of paper declaring, now playing, Vivaldi's Concerto in B minor. So he stops to listen for a minute. All right, back to the book. While the morning rush hour may technically have the most foot traffic and thus the most potential eyeballs and ears to sway, commuters are simply not in the right frame of reference to stop and listen. Polls consistently show that people are at their most stressed during rush hour, and when people are stressed and focused on getting to work through busy crowds, they don't have the mental capacity to focus on anything else. 
This is an important lesson which Susan Kayser learned through trial and error. She plays in the subway stations in the late morning. She never plays during rush hour, and she rarely performs after 2 p.m. After 2 p.m., Susan claims, the atmosphere changes everything. People are more negative. No matter what Susan Kayser does, she'll always get a better response after rush hour. No matter what she tries, she won't get teenagers to respond to Chopin's classics like they will to American Top 40 hits. That's why she often plays songs familiar to the masses, especially in the afternoon. Quote, some people are just very receptive, end quote, Kayser said of her music. She said that their moods, the weather, and other things can make people listen in. Quote, other people are just not going to pay attention to any musician at all. Some people just don't like or appreciate music, end quote. If you look at the video footage of Joshua Bell's hour in the subway, you may also notice that Bell has situated himself in a peculiar spot. He's playing near the exit of L'Enfant Plaza, just near the turnstiles. Compare that to our street violinist, Susan Kayser, who always finds a spot in a tunnel or a long passageway in the subway system. In these long passages, people have more time to be exposed to her music as they walk. She learned early on that playing near entrances and exits had the worst returns, so she adapted and moved herself to prime locations where potential listeners would be more likely to stop and listen. Over the years, Kayser has figured out the frame of reference for her potential audience at different times of day, and she has adjusted where she plays, when she plays, and which songs she plays based on her now intuitive understanding of their frames of reference. Adaptation, at its essence, is the process of understanding how your audience thinks and how your audience will react to your message, or their frame of reference, in other words. Then, changing the delivery of your message to fit your audience's frame of reference. With Odorono, for example, Murphy and Young learned about customer misconceptions about the medical safety of antiperspirants and adapted by addressing the concern, rather than just ignoring the problem, in their advertising. Doing so was instrumental to boosting their sales. Understanding your audience's frame of reference is vital to capturing attention. Knowing your audience's history knowing what kind of people they are, that is important to use to guide their attention to something that's important that you want them to focus on. A quote from David Copperfield, the master illusionist, when I interviewed him. To captivate others using the framing reference or the framing trigger, you have to think through your audience's frames of reference. And while there are many considerations when it comes to understanding this, three stand out as the most important. First, determine the receptiveness of your audience. When is your audience at its most stressed, and when is it at its least stressed? When and where will they be the least distracted? What kinds of words and topics will automatically shut them down to your message? Second, understand your audience's concerns. What will their natural objections be to your message? What words or arguments will make them immediately become defensive? One tactic that works well when you're trying to get the attention of somebody who disagrees with you is to find a small piece of common ground to agree upon before making your more substantive arguments. People hold tight to their frames of reference, so you're not doing yourself any favors if your target audience is already on the defensive. And third, know the cultural norms and traditions of your audience. What would offend them or make them squeal with delight? Branding and messaging has to adapt to each culture's frame of reference. This is something brands forget all the time. Cosmetics giant Revlon once promoted a camellia-scented perfume for women in Brazil. A fragrance imitating the sweet-smelling flower is no problem in Western countries, but in Brazil and most Latin American countries, the camellia flower is prominently used at funerals. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want people to think about funerals and death when they smell me. As you can imagine, the fragrance landed with a thud. Adaptation, whether it's to your audience's immediate needs and conditions, to their cultural norms, or even to their political views, is essential to capturing attention. But adaptation is only the first part of the story when it comes to using the framing trigger. It's time to talk about the surprising and incredible power of agenda setting. How do politicians set the agenda? 
In 1997, a few years after Newt Gingrich's contract with America, revered Republican pollster Frank Luntz dropped a bombshell 222-page memo. The memo, titled Language of the 21st Century, outlined everything from talking points to the things Republican politicians ought to say and ought not to say to their constituents. For example, Luntz suggested that politicians say Washington instead of government when being critical of the federal government. People consistently showed disdain for Washington and his inaction, but like their local governments, Luntz said. He also recommended that Republican members of Congress refer to the estate tax as the death tax because polls showed that the full 10% more of the American public believed the death tax was unfair compared to the estate tax, despite the two being the exact same thing. As a subtitle of his 2007 book, Words That Work, proclaimed, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. Luntz is famous for his approach to political communications. He regularly holds focus groups that help him hone the messages of his clients, many of them top politicians at the state and national levels. He tests different phrases over and over again until he finds the ones that carry the most emotional resonance. Luntz sometimes takes his approach to the extremes. He famously used his techniques to reframe the word Orwellian as being clear and succinct instead of being destructive to the fabric of free society. Luntz himself is framed by party identification. If, you're, if you are a Republican, you are more likely to think that he's a brilliant strategist. If you're a Democrat, you're more likely to perceive him as a villain, finding ways to manipulate the public. Let's be clear. Luntz isn't the only one to manipulate talking points to set an agenda. It, hope, it happens on both sides of the aisle and in almost every country and political process. But regardless of your political leanings, Luntz proves that a simple change of words can have a dramatic effect on where and how we direct our attention. By keeping those words on the top of the news, politicians can make them salient in the minds of voters. You see this happen every day when you turn on your television and watch Fox News, CNN, CNBC, BBC, or any other cable news channel. When you open up CNN.com and the top story is another celebrity being arrested, instead of a story with far more glo important global consequences, such as uprising and protests in Ukraine or Thailand, your perceptions of what's important, and thus where to place your attention, are being framed. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more the media covers a story, the more the public demands information on the story. It doesn't stop until the story has reached its conclusion or the public has lost interest. Agenda setting is the act of changing the importance or salience of a specific topic in the minds of an audience. Agenda setting most often happens in the media. During the 2014 Bridgegate, when New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's administration was engulfed in controversy for closing lanes on the George Washington Bridge as retribution against a mayor who didn't endorse the governor, MSNBC, a left-leaning cable news network, and CNN covered the story for a whopping 142 minutes on the day the emails and texts were released. Fox News, a right-leaning cable news network, spent just 14 minutes and 30 seconds on the story that day. Now, which audience do you think was most likely to dismiss the Bridgegate story? Agenda setting goes farther than just pre-ordering the or reordering the priorities of the public. The though. If I tell you that even Albert Einstein failed his math classes, contrary to popular lore, he didn't, and I repeat it often enough, you will start believing that it's true, even though the fact that I'm repeating it has absolutely no impact on its validity. It's a cognitive bias called the illusion of truth effect, and it is a powerful after effect, after effect of clever agenda setting. In the 1970s, Researchers from Temple and Villanova Universities gave a group of 40 college students a series of 140 plausible assertions in politics, sports, medicine, and other topics that wouldn't be familiar to most students, such as 1. Tulane defeated Columbia in the first Sugar Bowl game. 2. French horn players get cash bonuses to stay in the U.S. Army. 3. Lithium is the lightest of all metals. 4. 
Outside of New York and Chicago, the tallest building in America is found in Dallas. 5. Australia is approximately equal in area to the continental U.S. Half of these statements were true, while the other half were lies given to the students. Students were asked to assess 60 of these statements at a time for their validity, and to rate their validity on a scale of 1 to 7. This was done a second time two weeks later, and one last time after another two-week break. The catch? 20 of the statements, randomly chosen, were repeated to the participants on the second and third occasions. The researchers found that the students consistently rated the statements that were repeated as more true and valid every time they were repeated. It didn't matter, matter whether the statement was true or false. For some reason, students would give higher statements or statements a higher truth rating than the last time they heard it. This is despite the fact that repeating a statement has absolutely no impact on whether it's true or not. Seeing the same statements multiple times gradually changed their frames of reference enough that they started believing that what they were reading was true. The effect has been studied many times by cognitive scientists. The familiarity of a statement seems to have an impact on our assessment of its validity. Now imagine what happens when you apply the illusion of truth effect to everyday life. Plausible statements like, climate change will have severe consequences for the planet's future, and global warming has plenty of skeptics in the scientific community. Those become more believable every time we hear them on the news, on the radio, or on social media. Repetition and the illusion of truth effect amplify agenda setting, and thus the amount of attention we give toward one side of a debate versus the other. This is why agenda setting is such a powerful tool for capturing attention. It changes the frames of reference of your audience. Repetition, in moderation, is the key to setting your agenda and making your cause more important to the audience. In advertising, repetition to set an agenda is known as effective frequency. The number of times an audience has to be exposed to a message before either a response is made or the repetition becomes worthless. Repetition creates familiarity, salience, and credibility the latter through the illusion of truth effect. But repetition is only effective when people aren't paying much attention to you. One study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that repetition did indeed increase the persuasiveness of an argument, even a weak argument, but only when little processing of messaging content occurred. But once you've captured your audience's attention, and they are listening, your arguments had better be strong, because additional repetition will start decreasing the strength of an argument. Once you have somebody's attention, repetition can backfire, changing your audience's frame of reference to be more negative or more annoyed. Only use repetition when your audience is barely aware of your existence. Agenda setting isn't just a tool politicians can use to sway the frames of reference of voters, though. It's also a powerful weapon for changing the frames of reference of customers and users. Why is everybody buying Twinkies? Twinkies, the sponge cake with a white cream filling, have been a staple food on the shelves of grocery stores and big retailers for decades. I personally don't like them, but I can't say I know a lot of people who love them. But in late 2012, Twinkie sales took off like a rocket ship. Why? It wasn't because Twinkies had become any tastier, or because the company launched a new marketing campaign. Instead, after years of strikes and managerial incompetence, Hostess Brands, the owner of the Twinkie, announced that it was going out of business. The snack cakes would grace short store shelves no more, so people rushed to their local stores and bought all the Twinkies they could. Photos of empty shelves stormed the web. When we believe an opportunity is about to disappear, we suddenly start paying attention, even though nothing else about the situation has changed. It's because we have a natural fear of missing out and an aversion to loss. In the case of the Twinkie, its sudden end drove up its value, even though nothing had changed about it but scarcity. Scarcity and the fear of missing out are powerful tour tools for changing someone's agenda. The fear of missing out drives a lot of deals in the tech industry too. 
In my work as a venture capitalist, when portfolio companies decide they're going to raise a new round of funding, I coach them to set up as many investor meetings in a row as possible. The reason I suggest this to my startups is because investors typically don't want to make the first move. They often wait to see what other investors are going to do and to gather more information. If a funding round is moving slowly, investors have few incentives to agree to terms. But if one or more, one or two investors say yes, and an entrepreneur tells the other 50 she's already met with that they have already raised 50,000, sorry, 500,000 of the 1 million target, investors will suddenly return calls. I've seen fellow investors make ridiculous, overpriced offers just because a deal is about to close, and I'm guilty of it too. The fundamentals of my portfolio companies haven't changed, just the scarcity of access. Scarcity is yet another form of agenda setting, because scarcity changes the importance of a topic and thus changes our frame of reference. Which startups investors will pursue dramatically changed simply due to perceived scarcity. When investors view an opportunity as suddenly scarce, their attention and receptiveness increase. It's a concept known as commodity theory, first proposed by T.C. Brock in 1968, and further expanded by Dr. Robert Cialdini in his, in his classic 1984 book titled Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. The premise of commodity theory is simple. The scarcer something becomes, the more we value it. But the reason for why something becomes scarce matters. One experiment conducted by Theo Verhollen of Tilburg University um, had 230 female subjects asked to evaluate three recipe books from the same editorial series and choose one. Verhollen gave subjects some information on each book, letting the women know that the two books were ab the first two books were abundantly available, but the third was in limited supply. For the, for the third book, some were told that it was limited due to accidental circumstances and others told that it was limited due to popularity. The, what Verhallen found was that while all, group, all groups chose the limited supply book more often, their frames of reference for doing so differed. Subjects evaluated a book that was in limited supply due in production issues as more costly and more unique. But when subjects evaluated a book limited in, in supply due to its popularity, their evaluation of its worth didn't change, just its uniqueness. Framing something as popular doesn't change its worth. Framing something as inherently limited in supply does. Compare the following two statements to see what I mean. Statement one. Our cookies are made with the finest chocolate chips and organic ingredients. We always sell out because people love them so much. Statement two. Our cookies are made with the best ingredients, but the ingredients we use are about to go out of season. We will only be selling them this week. After that, they won't be available until next year. Which cookies do you think you're more likely to buy at that given moment? The ones that are about to disappear for a year, of course. And that's exactly what happened with the Twinkie. When the scarce cookie makes its return next year, you can bet people will be lining up to grab a box. When the Twinkie made its return to store shelves in July of 2013, after Hostess was acquired out of bankruptcy, sales jumped by seven times the his their historical records. If you're trying to capture attention using the framing trigger, then having a scarce product is useful. But there are multiple ways to create scarcity without having an actual shortage. Woot.com, one of the original daily deal sites, creates scarcity by selling only one item at a time and having it available only for 24 hours, after which time it disappears. Side note, Amazon acquired Woot in 2010 for $110 million. You can also simply present something as scarce, like the cookies we just discussed. In fact, a 1975 study found that if you present people with two identical glass jars, one with 10 cookies and another with just two, they will assign a much higher value to the cookies in the jar with just two. Any cues that demonstrate the scarcity of the product will have an impact on attention. You can also create scarcity by simply limiting access. When Google first launched Gmail, for example, it made its email service scarce by only offering a small number of invites to the public at a time. This created a frenzy. I remember people offering $100 or more to buy my first batch of Gmail invites. It placed Google at the top of message boards and news stories. 
Nowadays, you'll find lots of startups that implement invite systems to increase the attention on and perceived value of the product. <clears throat> Clubhouse. Commodity theory and the fear of missing out also apply when it comes to information, and perhaps they're part of the reason why we check Facebook, Politico, or our text messages every day, or multiple times a day. Josh Elman, a partner at venture firm Greylock Partners and a former product manager at Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, argues that the fear of missing out drove the success of all the major social networks. One of the reasons why Facebook attracts your attention is it has information that you can only get there. And if you're not getting that information, you're missing out. If I'm not paying attention to Facebook, then I'm totally missing out, explains Elman. He emphasizes that the fear of missing out drives daily interaction. It helps explain why LinkedIn, for example, added LinkedIn Today, a portal with the most important professional and business news. Making people feel like they will miss out if they are not using your product or listening to your ideas is yet another way to create scarcity, set the agenda, and capture attention. Now that we have a firmer grasp on adaptation and agenda setting, let's see how one of the masters of attention utilizes these techniques to command an audience. How Magicians Manipulate Frames so here's the card, says John Armstrong, a baby-faced man with a distinctive pair of black glasses. We are seated near a window in the famous magic castle of Los Angeles. In his hand is a deck of cards. He shows me the king of diamonds from the top of the deck. So I have this card and I'm going to change the card, he states. Armstrong simply turns the card in his hand and without any hesitation, it transforms into the four of spades. I begin to laugh. I tried, but I couldn't follow his subtle movements. Quote, let me explain something to you, Armstrong declares. If I turn the card over in such a way that it seems suspicious, like putting my hand over it or something, even though I'm not doing anything, suspicion arises, right? End quote. He places his hand on the top of the card to demonstrate. Armstrong pauses for a moment, then continues, quote, and I can use that because I can say, here's the card, hold on to it and now all your attention is on the card. And yet I haven't done anything to the card. But then that's when I am going over here in the deck, he says as he shuffles the 51 other cards in his hands, to do my, dear, my dirty work. Armstrong is a master of harnessing the framing trigger, using both adaptation and agenda setting to, to amaze his audience. As chairman of the Magic Castle in the Academy of Magical Arts, Armstrong is among the elite when it comes to close-range magic. He is a master at manipulating his audience's attention so they never can figure out the secret to his magic. The result is a flawless performance and a sense of delight. Much of Armstrong's craft doesn't come from the card tricks but from his intimate knowledge of how his audience thinks. His goal is to instill an unwilling acceptance of the unbelievable in his audience. For example, if a magician begins to perform a card trick and just before the big reveal, the magician's assistant suddenly loses her top, and when you look back at the trick there's an elephant, you won't accept the trick. Why? Because you know something must have happened while you were looking away. It was definitely a ruse. You didn't accept the unbelievable. However, if you place a volunteer into a box wheeled on stage, and without any obvious distractions, an elephant pops out, you will accept it. Yes, you know that the person didn't actually disappear, but you can't fathom for the life of you how the magician pulled off the trick. In some cases, members of Armstrong's audience will be dead set on figuring out the secret to one of his tricks. Their frame of reference is to figure out his trick. He will quickly pick up on his audience's intent and adapt to the fact by changing the trick. If, if someone keeps staring at the deck of cards in his hands, for example, he changes the trick so the actual dirty work occurs away from the card deck. Sometimes he will remove the key card from the deck, making the deck a decoy to distract the audience. They don't suspect a thing because their audience's, their attention is focused in the wrong direction. But perhaps Armstrong's best trick comes from his ability to set the agenda by setting low expectations and wildly exceeding them. Armstrong often starts his routine with a bit of fumbling and nervousness to make the audience think he is not in complete control. Every time he does this, he's utilizing agenda setting and repetition to make his audience think he's simply a fool. Viewing Armstrong as a bumbling fool is now their frame of reference. 
But when suddenly he defies those expectations by pulling off one of his tricks with complete mastery, the audience's expectations all go out the window, and they become far more receptive and attentive to the rest of his show. They're caught off guard by it, and that sort of sets the bar, and that happens very, very early on, on, Armstrong explained. Now they're like, well, wait a minute, I just thought this was going to be kind of lame, but now this, that is a really good trick, and they're already off their guard. Armstrong is a master of framing. He uses adaptation to keep his audiences guessing, and he uses agenda setting and repetition to set and break their expectations. The key is that Armstrong, through years of shows and research, has come to intuitively understand his audience's frames of reference, much like Susan Kayser has in the streets of New York City, or Edna Murphy did when she found a way to change the agenda when it came to deodorant. Some final words on frames of reference. The framing trigger is different from the other captivation triggers because it sets the stage for all the others. The framing trigger has a major impact on both our short attention, short-term focus, and our long attention, long-term interest. By using the framing trigger, you can get on your audience's radar and either adapt to or change their frame of reference so that they become more receptive to you and your message. People don't change their frames of reference on a dime, though, and for good reason. If we kept changing our opinions and listening to every argument somebody threw our way, we would be overwhelmed. This is why we have frames of reference in the first place. They help us understand our world through the lens of our past experiences. So, you need to take the time to first understand your audience's frames of reference before choosing a strategy for capturing attention. Your audience is not keenly aware of the reason why they reject a resume, put on deodorant, donate to a pl political campaign, or coast by Susan Kayser, the violinist, on their way to work. But now, you are. And you can use that to your advantage. Forcing people out of their frames of reference by harnessing the framing trigger is a subtle and nuanced way of capturing attention. But sometimes it's necessary to make a more direct approach. In the next chapter, we will explore how the next captivation trigger, disruption, can help us more capture attention. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.